Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Cara. I'm from Strata Community Association. As you can see here, we're the peak industry body in Strata and soon-to-be community titles in WA and across Australia. I've been in Strata now for just over seven years, and most people that I talk to when I say I work in Strata, the most common response I get is, what's that? So I've got very good at explaining in basic terms, hopefully, that's easy for everyone to understand what Strata is and how it works. It's something that we do all need to learn more about and get used to because, as David has articulated there, it's obviously becoming a much more common way of life for most of us. Those of us who have been born and raised in Perth are used to our green tidal houses and strata can be a bit of a foreign concept until you experience it for the first time. But as I said, we're definitely moving that way and it's important to educate yourself before you start uh, looking to move into an apartment. So what does strata titled mean? Here's a technical extract from the legislation which says the manner of division from time to time of a parcel into lots or into lots and common property under a strata plan. So most of us are familiar with your green title house, which means that when you purchase the property, you're buying the entire parcel of land. Strata title is when a parcel of land is taken by a developer like Finbar, for example, and they divide that parcel up into multiple lots and common property as well. So instead of buying your whole parcel of land, you're actually buying part of a parcel. So commonly we see strata title in apartment buildings, um, but also you'll see a lot of strata title around the place, which can look a lot of the time like green title properties. So little villa schemes where the owners might just share a driveway and a bit of garden out the front, duplexes, um, rear subdivisions, all of those things are often strata titled. So why are people moving into strata? Again, I think David's covered this very well um, and, and told you where the trends are heading. Uh, it certainly has a lot to do with lifestyle and location. I won't go into that in detail because I think he's covered it. Uh, the facilities, here's some examples here of some of the facilities we're starting to see in apartment developments now. You get games rooms, saunas, pools, gyms, spas, communal areas, barbecue areas, theatre rooms, all sorts of stuff. So it's really providing people uh, all of these amenities that they wouldn't otherwise be able to have in their home. Uh, it's low maintenance. You can basically shut your front door to your apartment and not have to worry about doing the gardening and all of those things that you have in your house. Security is a big one. Secure parking, secure entry to the building, particularly for people living on their own and first home buyers. My first home was actually in an apartment and uh, there's certainly um, a good feeling around coming home and knowing that you're, you know, surrounded by other people. Affordability, which David has talked about, and a sense of community as well, which is a growing trend that we're noticing. Obviously, we're living now in a technological age where we're all on our phones and iPads all the time and seem to be talking to each other less, but uh, we are starting to see that people are craving that sense of community again and want to get to know their neighbours and want to um, have those social interactions. So this is where the buildings are now starting to create these environments where owners can have and residents can have monthly sundowners or movie nights and all sorts of things. So what do you actually own when you buy a strata property? This is really important to understand um, because it is what you are purchasing and, and often it is misunderstood. So when you purchase a strata title property, you're buying a lot. So you're buying one lot of the overall parcel that I mentioned earlier. And what your lot includes can differ from one property to the next. So it's really important on any particular property that you're looking at to understand for that property specifically what exactly you're buying. So in an ordinary apartment, high-rise apartment development, usually your lot will include your apartment itself, the balcony, car bays, storage units and things like that. However, it will usually only include those air the cubic space of those areas. So as much as you own that apartment, you'll generally only own to the internal surfaces of the apartment. So essentially the airspace within the apartment. The actual building structure itself is common property, which I'll talk more on later. So that's a really important thing to remember, that you don't necessarily own you know, the windows or the wall structure surrounding the apartment. You're actually buying the internal space. And as well as owning your lot, you also own an undivided share in the common property. 
So the common property, as I mentioned, can include and often does include in high-rise apartment buildings the actual building structure as well as all of the common areas. So lifts, walkways, foyers, common facilities, your pools, gyms, spas, um, anything basically that's not included in someone's apartment. So what you can and can't do with your property when you buy one. So just because you may own your apartment doesn't mean that you can just do whatever you want with it. Part of living as part of a community is that you do have to be courteous and uh, respectful of the people that you're living and sharing with. So here's an example here on your left where um, someone has installed shutters on their balcony. So although those shutters are sitting within the space of what they own, they actually would need approval to be able to install that. And that's because there are bylaws and legislation that actually governs how these properties are run. And things like that, where it's going to change the appearance of the building, you need to get approval for before you go ahead and do it. As you can imagine, if everybody went ahead and did whatever they want, the building would start looking very different to how it was intended. And another example here on the right is somebody changing their floor coverings from carpet to tiles. This is another thing that a lot of people move in and think, it's my apartment, I can replace the flooring if I want to. But often you'll find that there are rules around what flooring you can put down. And that's because of things like noise, for example. Um, we have had lots of cases where someone pulls up the carpet, puts tiles down, and suddenly the person below them can hear everything they're doing. So there are rules around how you use your apartment. And you're not expected to, to know them, them all in great detail, but the important thing is, is before you do anything to check with um, the experts and your, or your strata manager or real estate agent to see what you are able to do. So how is all of this managed? Obviously, when you see these big um, buildings going up and they've got lots of facilities and pools and lifts and car stackers and all sorts of things, uh, how does it all get managed? It's obviously, it's a big asset and it is a lot to manage. So there's three tiers of management that operates these buildings, the strata company, the council of owners and the strata manager. So firstly, the strata, ma uh, the strata company, which is the overarching umbrella. Most people, when you say strata company, assume that that's the professional company that's engaged, like a strata manager to manage the building for you, but that's not actually the case. So the strata company is actually a form of body corporate and all of the owners of the apartments are members of the strata company. So very similar to shareholders of a company. Basically, when you buy an apartment, you buy your lot, you buy a share of the common property and you become a member of the strata company. So what is the strata company responsible for? The strata company is ultimately responsible for enforcing any rules and bylaws for the property and managing, maintaining and controlling the common property for the benefit of all owners. So as I mentioned before, all of the common property that exists there, pools, spas, whatever they are, or even just the building structure, the strata company is responsible to maintain. So how are decisions made? As you can imagine, often these buildings could have, say, 200 different owners in them. How do those 200 people actually work together to run a building? There are a lot of structures in place and framework to make this work. And when it's done well, it does, it does work well. Um, so all owners have the opportunity to vote at general meetings. So when you do buy a strata property, you do actually get a say. It's not a scary thing to think that this building's going to change around you and you have no, no say in that. You do actually get a vote on important things at general meetings. And then a council of owners is elected for the day-to-day -day management and decision-making. So who are the council of owners? Usually it's a group of between three and seven owners in the scheme and they're elected at each annual general meeting. So every year the owners are all invited to attend either in person or by sending in their vote an annual general meeting and they all have the, the opportunity to vote at that meeting. So that's the forum for the council of owners to be elected for the coming year and your council of owners are really like a board of directors. They're your day-to-day -day management team for the complex. So what is the council responsible for? Essentially, the council is responsible for all of the functions of the strata company. So all of the responsibilities that the strata company has to manage and control the common property, the council of owners are the management team doing that on behalf of all of the other owners. And they're also importantly responsible for providing instructions to the strata manager and they make their decisions at council meetings. 
So lastly, the strata manager. Who is the strata manager? Uh, the strata manager is a just a service provider that is engaged by the owners to assist them in the management of their scheme. Obviously, as a group of owners, you're a probably not going to know all that you need to know about strata law and what you need to do. Um, B, you're not going to have the time to do it in these large buildings. It's, it's a lot of work um, and most people are busy. Uh, so it is really important to engage a professional person who's experienced in the area to assist with that process. So the strata manager, their responsibilities can vary depending on one scheme to the next and it depends on what the owners contract them to do. So again, as a group of owners, you actually control what you want your strata manager to do and you put a contract in place with them. But generally speaking, they'll carry out all of the administrative functions. So for example, if the council of owners decide that they want to um, get a new gardener or replace the pool heater, they'll tell the strata manager that's what we've decided to do and the strata manager will arrange it for them. So it basically takes all of the leg work off the owner's hands. And importantly, a big part of the strata manager's role is to provide guidance to the council of owners. As I mentioned, it is, it is a big job and the legislation that sits behind it is very long and complex. And as a group of owners, um, you can't be expected to know everything that you need to know to run these buildings well. So that's where your strata manager can provide you with that guidance. And how are decisions made? The strata manager actually has no decision-making power. Uh, so they are fully reliant on the council of owners instructing them on what they want to do. Obviously, it's your asset as an owner. It's your asset and your investment. So um, the strata manager leaves those decisions with you to make about how you want that asset managed. So how is it funded? Obviously, um, everything costs money and the more facilities that you have, the more there is to maintain and pay for. So um, some of you may have heard of strata levies. When you're looking to buy any strata property, you'll see it disclosed what the strata levies are. Usually they're raised on a quarterly basis um, and they're raised in accordance with a budget that, again, is agreed at every annual general meeting. So once a year... All of the owners come to that meeting and they're provided with the opportunity to vote on what they want their budget to be for the complex. So again, you actually as an owner have the power to influence what your levies are. But of course, things cost what they cost. You can't decide to have a budget of $100 because you don't want to spend any money if it's going to cost $20,000 to run something. So your levies will cover the maintenance and repair of the common property, the insurance for the building and then the administration requirements. And strata levies can be a bit off-putting for some people. They think, well, that's an extra expense that I wouldn't have if I was buying a green title house. But what you really need to think about is all of the costs that you do have when you own a green title house. It might, may not come in the form of quarterly levies, but you still have to pay for your building insurance. You've still got all of your maintenance requirements. You've got to do the gardening. If you've got a pool, you've got to look after that clean your gutters, all of those sorts of things. So when you actually add up all those costs, generally you'll find that the strata levies are, are pretty affordable because, again, you're, you're sharing the cost with a group of owners. So you get a pool, you don't have to pay for the whole pool, you're sharing it with everyone. And lastly, unit entitlement. So you've got a budget for the complex, you've got to pay levies towards that budget, but how do you know how much you pay versus how much your neighbour pays? Or for example, you might have a one bedroom unit on the ground floor and someone else in the building has a penthouse on the 15th floor. So unit entitlement is a way of working that out. And it's determined by a valuer prior to the complex coming into existence. So the valuer will look at the value of each of the apartments and, and divvy up the unit entitlement accordingly. So generally, if you had that one bedroom unit on the ground floor, you would have a lower unit entitlement to the person in the penthouse. The unit entitlement is important because it determines, in some cases, your voting rights at meetings. It determines your share of the common property, your ownership share of the common property, and subject to any other bylaws, it will determine the proportion of the levies that you pay against the budget. So for example, if your unit entitlement is 10 of 100, then your vote makes up one tenth, you own one tenth of the common property, and your contributions or levies will make up one tenth of the overall budget. 
and this middle one here about the ownership of the common property, that would come into play, for example, um, and we're starting to see it more commonly now where some strata schemes are starting to get really old. The owners may not want to maintain them. There might only be five units on the block, but it's a development site now and someone could put a 20-storey tower there. The owners might decide that they want to sell that off to a developer and sell the land, and that's where the unit entitlement would come into play because that will determine how much each owner will get of that. So that's all from me. I think we'll have questions at the end if there are any. Thank you.